very warm welcome, one and all, to the 18th Annual Conference of the Society for Musicology in Ireland, and in particular to this event, our keynote address, which on this occasion is given by Julian Johnson, Regis Professor of Music at Royal Holloway, University of London. My name is Harry White, Professor of Music at University College Dublin, and Chair of the Organising Committee for this year's conference. As many people here this evening will know, the conference was originally intended to take place last June, but it scarcely seems an exaggeration in the present crisis to say that it has gone the way of all flesh and moved online. To suggest that the world is sick sounds more like a philosophical point of view than a matter of mere fact. To say that the world is unwell also falls short of the mark, but in either case, the phrase at least denotes an intensity of global crisis without precedent since the Second World War. In these dark days, it is perhaps more important than ever to rage against the dying of the light and to assemble, if only virtually, in a better cause. Specifically on this account, as well as for many other reasons, it is a singular privilege to welcome Julian Johnson and very briefly to preface his address this evening. In more ordinary circumstances, I would seek to convey at least something of the magnitude, intellectual versatility, and sheer currency of Professor Johnson's engagement with music, an engagement underpinned by a passionate advocacy on behalf of European art music in particular. But this obligation seems even more germane and indeed urgent in the radical silence which has suddenly descended upon the performance of music everywhere. In six monographs and over 80 book chapters, essays and reviews, Julian Johnson's musicological voice is one which constantly privileges music as a conduit of experience. As any student of his work will know, this preoccupation extends to music as a category of experience and an otherwise inaccessible one at that. The thoughtful but firmly voiced corollary of this preoccupation is that musical works are not all of the same specific gravity of purpose or complexity, and nor is their meaning delimited or exhausted by the agency of sociological discourse. In a magisterial sequence of monographs, including Webern and the Transformation of Nature, 1999, Who Needs Classical Music, 2002, Mahler's Voices, Expression and Irony in the Songs and Symphonies, 2009, Out of Time, Music and the Making of Modernity, 2015, and most recently, after Debussy, Music, Language and the Margins of Philosophy, 2020, these existential and aesthetic preoccupations have been strikingly and variously deepened. Such brilliant and arresting enterprises have not gone without dissent. There is an entire scene of Anglo-American musicological practice, which by instructive contrast interrogates music primarily as a domain of social discourse and deliberately or otherwise upholds identity politics as a foremost consideration. In its current manifestation, this consideration accordingly narrows music's semantic and structural expressivity of purpose. Indeed, the title of Professor Johnson's address this evening gives some hint of that comparatively new orthodoxy, which is nevertheless at least 35 years old. But what strikes home in Julian's own work is the patient unfolding of a perception that is as various as it is penetrating. If the doors of perception were cleansed, William Blake famously observed, everything would appear as it is infinite. This poeticism acutely transpires in Julian's engagement, not only with the avatars of Austro-German modernism, most especially perhaps Schoenberg, Webern and Mahler, but across the Western canon, most recently in the music of Debussy and later French composers. His proposition in After Debussy that, quote, we understand both music and language better through an exploration of their non-identical proximity, unquote, 
apostrophizes the delicacy and discrimination of this encounter. The semantic, indeed, the somatic experience of such music in Julian's hands stands revealed as a tangible and intelligible discourse in itself. In recovering music as a category of experience and as a meditation upon experience, Julian Johnson persuasively asks us to reconsider the musical work, not only as an agent of history, but as a discourse that changes through history. In this solicitation, the sovereign mastery and scholarship of neighboring dis discourses, notably philosophy, aesthetics, the visual arts and literature, which Julian's own work commands, has few rivals. And it does seem to me highly significant that his work is interdisciplinary at every turn. His career as a musicologist has emancipated art music from the specious charge of elitism and disengagement and restored its relationship to other, perhaps more easily admissible discourses. It is a career that has brought him many honors, including the Dent Medal of the Royal Musical Association in 2005, Fellowship of the British Academy in 2017, and appointment to the first ever Regis Professorship of Music in 2013. It is also a career that has been distinguished by a determination to foster a wider understanding of music in the public domain, as evidenced by Julian's prominence as a broadcaster, especially for the BBC and as a public lecturer. What should have been, not least for musicologists, a Beethoven year has become perforce a year of disease and contagion, a COVID year. One can only guess at the number of celebratory events, performances especially, marking the 250th anniversary of the composer's birth, which have been canceled in the past several months. But tonight is one of those occasions when both of these force fields are in play, when Beethoven then suddenly becomes of account to our global crisis now. We owe that characteristically thoughtful apposition to Julian Johnson, the abstract of whose address also promises an exploration of the tension between, quote, the sensuous and the linguistic, the sonorous and the discursive, unquote, in our apprehension of Beethoven's music. Although it is not our practice in any case to include questions at the end of these keynote lectures, I must on this pre-recorded occasion not only extend the warmest of welcomes to Julian on behalf of the Society for Musicology in Ireland, but thank him in advance for his address. It is entitled, The Blasphemy of Talking Beethoven in 2020, Listening Again to the Heilige Dank Gesang. We are deeply grateful, Julian, and we look forward enormously to what is to follow. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry we're not together in the same room for this. Everything I'm about to say in my talk is intended as just one voice in a much wider conversation, one we would undoubtedly have had if we'd all been in Dublin as planned. So I apologise in advance if my lecture sometimes sounds a bit like I'm lecturing you. I'd have much preferred that we all went to the bar afterwards where we could disagree with each other in good humour. All the same, I'm really delighted and honoured to be part of this wonderful virtual meeting. And I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to Professor Harry White and the organising committee of the Society for Musicology in Ireland for trusting me to give this talk. I'd also like to thank Brian Whitelaw for his wonderful editing of my recording of this lecture. Any remaining clunky moments are entirely my own. Thank you. <laughs> 
earlier this year, in the first month of lockdown, I heard Susie Klein introducing this piece on Radio 3. She offered a heartfelt and thoughtful framing, explicitly linking Beethoven's Hymn of Thanks to the global crisis, not just because of its subtext of illness and convalescence, but specifically with having to confront mortality alone, in isolation, and in a world where so many former certainties have been lost. Most listeners, I imagine, would have found this link to the extraordinary circumstances of our time resonant and helpful, perhaps even moving. Joseph Kerman once suggested that Stravinsky's famous comment about the Große Fuga might apply just as well to the Heilige Dankgesang, that it is, quote, an absolutely contemporary piece of music that will be contemporary forever, unquote. That seems strangely apposite in 2020, not least because Kerman went on to say of the opening bars of Beethoven's hymn that they seem, he said, to be whispered by a convalescent who was just and barely past a supreme crisis and who still seems to be under oxygen. The title of my lecture plays, of course, on that of Susan McClary's 1987 essay, The Blasphemy of Talking Politics During Bach Year, itself written in relation to Adorno's 1950 essay, Bach Defended Against His Devotees, published in the 200th anniversary year of the composer's death. Both essays deal with the problematic legacy of canonic repertoire. Both conclude this music nevertheless retains a critical potential today that is negated neither by the conservative culture with which it's associated, nor by the tendency of a traditional musicology to render it autonomous and thus apolitical. At the end of her essay, McClary famously inverts the assumption of her own title in a way that challenges readers who might prefer easy slogans to critical argument. What she wants to do, it turns out, is to address the blasphemy in the context of the new musicology of talking about Bach's music insisting we have a responsibility to rethink and re-engage with the canon, not simply ignore it. More than 30 years after McClary and 70 years after Adorno, here we are again. Because in 2020, the 250th anniversary of the composer's birth, talking about Beethoven's music has become deeply problematic. My talk today is about listening to that music, specifically listening to the third movement of the quartet in A minor, opus 132. But it's also about how we musicologists talk, write, and think about such music. More than that, it's about whether we even can or should talk about such music today. Next month, the University of Zagreb hosts a conference titled Musicology and its Future in Times of Crises. You might think this was one of the many responses to the global upheavals of this year. But actually, it was already advertised back in February, before most of us found ourselves in lockdown, before the world economy crashed, and before Black Lives Matter precipitated an overdue soul-searching at the heart of cultural and educational institutions. Well before the upheavals of 2020, musicology was already feeling distinctly conflicted. So to avoid misunderstanding, let me be clear. I'm talking about Beethoven precisely because it's problematic, because it's emblematic of central problems within musicology today. In foregrounding Beethoven's music, I'm neither ignoring nor ignorant of those pressing issues, nor that being silent on the politics of canonic music risks being taken for complicity, that it risks being a political act in the sense Philip Bowman wrote of in 1993, that sides with the wrong politics. But a keynote lecture should perhaps challenge current orthodoxies, not simply reproduce them. So my discussion of listening to Beethoven here is intended not to sidestep the political discourse around music, but to question some of its fundamental assumptions. To do so, I want to talk about the persistence of the aesthetic in music and its critical potential. The term has of course become widely misunderstood. As my colleague Steve Downs wrote some years ago, in parts of our discipline, the very notion of the aesthetic has become neglected, rejected, and even pilloried, apparently irrelevant to the new culturally informed 
and cutting edge critical interests of musicologists. So let me be clear how I use the term. By the term aesthetic in music, I mean that which is not only pre-discursive, but that which resists discourse and remains untouched by it. I take the term to refer to a kind of sense-making, which arises from a figuration of sensuous particulars, irreducible to the generality of discursive language. The philosopher Martin Zeil talks of aesthetic perception as a kind of attentiveness, not to the content or even outward appearance of an object, but simply as attentiveness to appearing, a mode of attention which produces what he calls a repleteness of experience. In aesthetic experience, Zale writes, we liberate ourselves from determination and thus engage in a mode of world encounter outside the confines of instrumental language. But isn't this merely a selfish pleasure, the metaphysical withdrawal of the aesthete that's been roundly condemned in recent musicology? Not according to the political theorist Jane Bennett, for one. She argues that such experience is not only possible in the modern world, but might be key to ethical behavior, a force that can help, in her words, propel ethical generosity. How else, she asks, does Kant's ought turn into can? My lecture therefore makes an argument for the persistence of the aesthetic, not as some entrenched conservative retreat, but on the contrary, as a radical space that contains within it the potential to foster a kind of awareness without which politics merely repeats the same entrenched and antagonistic positions. As Jane Bennett asks, how do we relate better to each other and to the world if we don't know how it feels to relate better to each other and to the world? These are risky and grand themes. You might conclude my raising them here is the worst kind of hubristic excess of the keynote lecturer, and that may well be the case. But these are unusual times for those of us who speak about the arts. We may need to risk more than we usually do if we're to survive at all. Musicologists have not been good at stating why what we do matters. To misquote Thoreau, don't we conference delegates live lives of quiet desperation, asking ourselves at the start of almost every paper the same unanswered question, why does any of this matter? If what is aesthetic within music can no longer be heard, drowned out by the noise of our own discourse, then perhaps it doesn't. The opening bars of the third movement of Beethoven's A minor quartet don't give us much to get hold of. The successive imitative entries, high to low, produces a kind of slow ripple effect in which the individuality of the four voices is quickly lost in a sequence of modal chords, breathing in and out like the music of some fragile harmonica. The musicologist rushes in to tell you that this short introduction gives way to the first phrase of a hymn consisting of the eight minim chords from bar two to bar six. But the innocent listener may not so easily remark any separation between introduction and first melodic phrase. What stands out more is the radical emptiness of simple chords given in implausibly long notes, sotto voce, and generally played without vibrato. Beethoven connoisseurs and first time listeners are all in the same boat here. It's a shocking absence of discernible motivic idea, rhythmic impetus, or tonal tension. Where is the creative Einfall from which this piece will grow? Where, for that matter, are the stylistic markers that suggest any historical provenance or the fingerprint of the famous composer? Even the four instruments don't sound like a string quartet. The modal harmony and lack of vibrato sounds more like a consort of viols 
seated in a circle playing to each other rather than a modern quartet facing outwards and performing to an audience. There's nothing here that says classical music, let alone Ludwig van Beethoven. The continuation doesn't offer much help either. In bar six, the falling fifth of the first violin is imitated at the octave by the second violin. But this time the entries are foreshortened by the simultaneous entry of viola and cello. There's no obvious logic of continuation in these exposed and fragile entries. The imitation implies the unfolding of Renaissance counterpoint, but without substance or continuity, these bare sounds seem to offer only an empty frame. A second set of slow harmonic chords return as before. And so it goes on until we've heard all five hymn-like phrases preceded by their imitative introductions. This movement is never discussed without mentioning Beethoven's own observation inscribed in the score that it's written in the Lydian mode. But what does that mean? The first phrase ends on a triad of D minor, the second on a triad of C major, the third on G, the fourth on F, and the fifth on an interruptive A major, the first chord in around three minutes of impossibly slow music to introduce an accidental. What are we to make of it all? The sequence of chords has a kind of childlike innocence in which being mesmerized by the wonder of each new chord displaces any expectation of good harmonic syntax. On the one hand, we're presented with apparent naivety. On the other, a kind of erratic presence, which for some, suggests a proximity to the divine, indicated by the movement's long-winded title. Either way, the powerful effect of this music is related to the absence of grammatical norms of good musical sense. In terms of the richly articulate and often loquacious habit of classical instrumental music, none more so than the conversational string quartet, this opening passage is disarmingly and disturbingly mute. What happens next is well known. The interruptive A major chord takes on a dominant function for the new section in D major, beginning from bar 31, which breaks into the timeless world of the opening music with the bright electric light of the present moment. Beethoven's semi-programmatic performance direction of Neue Kraftfühlend is superfluous. The new tempo, the hard-edged dynamic contrasts, the infectious sense of motion and harmonic direction, all palpably embody a sense of greater energy and life. In one swift turn, we're back in the world of the classical string quartet, albeit with that overpronounced tone of hyperreality that Beethoven so often achieves in the late quartets, and which makes us question its very familiarity. The first violin is too high and too sweet, but at the same time, dissociated from the whimsical grace notes of the second violin. The little repetitive patterns are too conventional and give way too suddenly to the onrush of intensification and short-lived climax. Mm -hmm. 
form of the entire movement is a five part A, B, A, B, A, an alternation of two worlds that might continue indefinitely. The return of the slow hymn in the central A section is intensified by suspensions not used in the first section. The second B section is as before, but more so, more lively still, and pushing forwards with yet more urgency. But the movement ends with the third and final Lydian section. It's marked mit inixter empfindel, yet stripped of any harmonic materials that might conventionally imply emotional expression. It has only the intensity of its tone, exposed in terrifyingly empty and slow lines. The first violin adds a new descant to expand the register towards the upper limits of its range, exceeding the reach of the choral voices the piece had earlier implied. The repetitive little neighbor note figure presses forward with a new urgency, and the whole texture expands through a massively drawn out crescendo, as if to promise that some final resolution will undoubtedly arrive. Through sheer concentration of sonority, this music seems to suggest something will catch fire. What is awaited will appear. Of course, you'd be right to rein me in here and remind me that this exceptional piece is an exception even in Beethoven's output. It's not how most of Beethoven goes. That's true of a great deal of what's presented in the late style, and yet which seems, through exploring its own extremes, to expose something latent at the heart of all his earlier music, and indeed the whole musical culture of which this music is emblematic. It's true too, that we could be listening here to any music for its tone, for its haptic, bodily, emp empathic function. I've singled out this piece in part because it's central to a repertoire in which we so often hear only the discursive, syntactical, semantic. Having reached the end of this extraordinary piece, lasting 20 minutes or so in performance, but with the temporal weight of a few hours, what is there to say about it? Well, we all know the formula. There's plenty we can say, historically, analytically, biographically, or a host of other angles from performance studies to disability studies that might be drawn into the musicologist's attempt to read the piece, to interpret it, to open out a discourse on its meanings from its composition in 1825 to its use as a kind of anthem in the time of COVID in 2020. I don't intend to rehearse here the very extensive commentary on the Heilige Gedankgesang, but let's think about a few of its recurrent aspects. As all program notes tell us, and most of my undergrads, the Heilige Gedankgesang was composed in May 1825 at Beethoven's summer retreat in Baden, following a period of serious illness. Rarely do we have such clear evidence to link a musical work to such a precise biographical event. So if you want to hear it as being about Beethoven's own illness and recovery, or indeed illness and recovery in general, there's your cue. Just to be sure that this quality of being embedded in the particularity of material life was not lost, Beethoven, of course, underlined it in a rare and rather wordy title, Holy Song of Thanksgiving to the Deity from a Convalescent in the Lydian Mode, or something along those lines. The title is, of course, an act of overdetermination. It's too precise, too tied in to the personal and the historical. But it reminds us that this famously timeless piece, in its musical language, as also in its historical identity, is at the same time rooted in the composer's own here and now. The point is nicely evidenced by the proximity between the sacred hymn melody and what Kerman called the preposterous little canon Beethoven sent his doctor in May 1825, one that reveals the hymn to be the inverse of a nonsense canon. As Kerman comments, Liszt could hardly thought of a more Mephistophelian travesty of the Heilige Dankesan. Analysis tells us that the movement is in double variation form, like the slow movement of the Ninth Symphony. The three slow hymn sections are in duple meter, and wholly in the Lydian mode based on F. These are interleaved with the two contrasting dance-like sections in D major and a lively triple meter 
But analysis also has much to say about the relation between this movement and the other four that make up the quartet in A minor, including the role that this central point plays in the larger narrative of the whole. Michiko Toira underlines that it's precisely by stepping outside of a narrative or discursive mode that the Heilige Dankgesang exerts its specific role within the wider temporal frame of the quartet. More specifically, she suggests that the alternation of the A, B, A, B, A structure has the effect of placing in parenthesis, not the modal sections, but the tonal ones, reversing the usual relationship of identity and other. At odds with the tonal trajectory of the quartet as a whole, this reversal is the means by which this movement is axial for the work's eventual resolution. Of course, resisting discourse doesn't shield the Heilige Gedankgesang from the fingers of prurient philosophers, to borrow a line from E.E. E. Cummings. After all, the Lydian mode betokens spirituality, right? Witness the similarly modal harmony that appears for the et incarnatus est of the Mrs. Solemnis, and so on. But the signs aren't merely stylistic or historical, they're also structural. In an article from 2013, John Paul Ito traces links between the structures of the A minor quartet and those of spiritual narratives in major world religions. In particular, he examines how the Heilige Dankgesang stages two opposing narrative structures, one tragic, the other comic, in the sense of Northrop Fry's four narrative modes, romance, tragedy, irony, and comedy. The tragic narrative here for Ito has to do with the progressive dissolution of the primary thematic material. As if, he says, the music is enacting its own death. Most obviously, of course, this occurs in the way the final section is reduced just to the first phrase of the hymn, and often given just as a fragment. This aspect of the piece, Ito concludes, quote, lends itself to being heard as a tragedy of an individual's dissolution, or more specifically, an individual's death, unquote. But this is in counterpoint with a second comic narrative. As Ito explains, quote, the type in which a transgression defeats an order enforcing hierarchy, unquote. One might agree with this reading of a narrative of dissolution in counterpoint with a second narrative that works in the opposite direction, but without having to adopt Ito's terms of dissolution as death and ascendancy as spiritual or transcendent. I hear fragility and dissolution in counterpoint with a slow process of coming to presence, but not as being in opposition. The second is enabled by the first. The first is the condition of the second. And there's nothing in this music to suggest anything so representational or linguistically determined. Half a century earlier, Kerman wisely dismissed the idea that the Heilige Dankgesang stage is a representation of death. In rejecting that position, Ito falls into the trap of reading this music too literally. One thing appears through the dissolution of the other, full stop. But Ito is surely correct to focus on the sense of physical strain in the fifth and final section. Only by the failure of the means can the magnitude of what appears be made clear. The weakness and fallibility of the means of presentation becomes a foil to what cannot be presented. Since Adorno's essays on the late style, it's commonplace to talk of Beethoven's late quartets as a kind of self-critique, a self-critique of his own middle period works, but thereby of the classical style more generally, and in particular, its discursive quasi-linguistic logic. The famous vocality of the late works, the foregrounding of a supersaturated lyrical intensity, is of course one of their alternative strategies. Like the Klagende Gesang, the A flat piano sonata, op. 110, the Heilige Dank Gesang uses the quality of emptiness and exhaustion as a foil. The thinner the material, the brighter the light that shines through it. Or put another way, the more attenuated the discourse, the stronger the sense of presence 
In the Heilige Gedankgesang, it is precisely the failure of the discursive that allows a non-discursive presence to emerge. As Michiko Toira writes in her 2013 article, Playing with Time, in the final section of the movement, quote, Beethoven strains the limits of sonorous expression so far that sound seems to burst from its own syntactical fabric. It's a refreshing reading from a refreshing source, since Michiko Toira, among many other things, is a highly accomplished violinist. Where most accounts of this work fixate on how, even here, motif and tonality still articulate narrative structures, Toira tells a different story of how sonority becomes the means by which time is expanded through the suspension of the usual discursive processes. It's no exaggeration to talk of this music in terms of the emancipation of the sonorous, a liberating of the effective power of material sound from the dominance of an abstract syntax. In distancing the discursive manner that underpins the classical style, the Heiliger Dankgesang foregrounds other things, not least the stillness of sonorous presence over the busyness of saying and doing, departing and arriving. It does so, however, in part through its own failure, the central strategy of modernism, Shea Adorno. Sonority is famously attenuated from the very beginning. Kerman underlines the unnaturally slow tempo at which the four string players can barely sustain their lines, as if to draw attention to the lack of orchestral force, a composed lack, which has of course subsequently been rectified by later arrangements of the piece for string orchestra. The sense of lack pervades the three slow sections of the movement whereas the contrasting D major sections are perfectly judged, fully achieved string quartet music. One strains for asceticism, Joseph Kerman again, while the other sparkles with trills, which as Elaine Sisman tells us, are heraldic signs that welcome present time. Michael Spitzer talks of the textural stringency of the last variation, whose visionary climax he suggests is wrought from the mutual abrasion of the voices. But the astonishing dissonances, which he identifies as, quote, perhaps the most lyrically extreme statement in all late Beethoven, unquote, is at the same time, as Joseph Kerman pointed out, neither another statement nor a variation of the hymn melody, but rather a liquidation in the form of a lengthy treatment of a single phrase. For Daniel Chua, the Heiliger Dankgesang is, quote, without doubt, one of the strangest and most outrageous of Beethoven's creations. The indeterminacy of its time structures, the symmetry of its propositions, the inability to synthesize contrast, the impotence of tonality, all make this work the absolute negation of all classical procedures, unquote. He too hears a dissolution of the temporality of tonality. The piece he writes, quote, evokes a remote ritual in which time no longer ticks with the purposeful linearity of 1825, but is made static and amorphous, unquote. Elsewhere, he talks about the movement's sense of indeterminacy and arbitrary progression. This, he writes, is a music that simply meanders. I disagree. Suspending the purposeful linearity of everyday time might initially appear as a kind of emptiness, but an emptiness that subsequently becomes the foil for a powerful sense of fulfilled presence. What Chua calls the brokenness of time is surely only a part of Beethoven's strategy to allow linear time to break in order for a fulfilled time to break through. Isn't this a definitive historical moment which Western music has wrestled with ever since from Mahler to Morton Feldman? Chua's last word on the piece, however, is wonderfully resonant. This is music he writes that, quote, confronts the very tools of thought, unquote. It comes close to what I'm trying to say. The Heiliger Dankgesang is a remarkable piece for many reasons. One of them is that it is the work of a composer who epitomizes the idea of music as discursive, language-like, shaped by proposition, comment, argument, question, conclusion, and wait for it, 
meaning. And yet, here he presents us with music that distances itself from those ideas, which is precisely why I'm talking about it. Not just because Beethoven is problematic, not because he offers a canonic example of how all sonorous music challenges the discourses we bring to it, but because Beethoven, the composer whose music is emblematic of discourse, both within music and about music, here undoes himself. All music makes sense sonorously. All music, therefore, resists the discourse we bring to it, our attempts to explain and analyze, to interpret and make mean. In this, Beethoven's is no different to any other music. If I privilege this repertoire yet again, it's because it articulates a paradigmatic fracture in discursive language with which we still not come to terms. Interest in the relation between music and language generally fixes either on their similarity or their difference. My own interest is with the tension between the two, the resonant non-identity of musical sense-making and linguistic sense-making. My problem with musicology is that we seem addicted to reducing the first to the second, to rendering music into the terms of discourse when we should be doing the opposite, making space to allow music to challenge our discursive modes. So my argument is that a truly critical practice of musicology would consist not in suppressing the aesthetic in favor of the discursive, but quite the opposite. The value of music, any music, understood in aesthetic terms rather than those of history, sociology, or politics, lies precisely in its irreducible particularity in not being a vehicle for something else in refusing to be, to use a horrible term of the last decade, freighted with the extra musical. The critical value of music lies not in its meaning, but precisely in the fault lines it opens up within the very idea of discursive meaning. So our progressive silencing of the muteness of music has been a low point in recent musicology. In the name of making music's critical potential more articulate, the legacy of the once new musicology is that it risks silencing the very thing that makes music different. To insist what really matters lies in the intellectual domain of discursive meaning rather than the sensuous logic of the aesthetic is to hold the messy experience of art at a safe distance. It's the deceptive trick of politicians, managers and academics alike to locate truth and power in higher level ideas, systems, and abstract processes rather than the mere material they order. I am genuinely at a loss to understand the strange accusation that to talk about the aesthetic in music is to essentialize it. Isn't that completely back to front? Isn't aesthetic engagement with music absolutely particular, material, sonorous, located? Conversely, isn't all discourse about music based on claims of universality, truth, and reason? There are many ways in which we might repurpose musicology today for all that it seems utterly irrelevant outside universities. I'm the last person to say how these things should or should not be done. And I make no judgment here. We're all trying. My trying is to say that I think we make a mistake if in our deep-seated desire to see social justice, we lay the blame for injustice at the wrong door. We redeem neither ourselves nor our discipline by blaming it all on the music, the music itself, the great deception of the aesthetic on which canonic art is founded. That really would be to essentialize music. It would be to make music itself the concentrated form of centuries of social injustice. I can see that distancing ourselves from it would be a first step to processing our guilt, dealing with our own self-hatred for ever believing in it or for participating in elite culture. That would be the ultimate revenge of musicology on music, to deny music any existence of its own outside of what musicology says about it. If it were real life, it would be an abusive relationship. As it is, it's merely hubristic, 
and slightly ridiculous since nobody but musicologists cares what musicologists say. What should we think of those generations of listeners who have happily essentialized music for the last few centuries and who have ascribed to it an importance that seems to touch on something more than the sum of its social functions? Were they all wrong, misguided by metaphysical nonsense and the ideology of the aesthetic until the elite science of musicology came to set them right? The mystification of class politics here is breathtaking, but there's more. There's the sheer arrogance of a musicology that dismisses those who worry about the notes, the music itself, the score, because by far the greatest number of those who do so are musicians, those mute workers of the musical world whose embodied practical knowledge and insight, evidenced in the infinite care with which they shape every note and every phrase, is dismissed by musicology as ignorant. Musicians view that music makes a sense of its own through its own sonorous details is apparently wrong-headed, naive, metaphysical. Only musicologists, it turns out, a hands-off managerial class that refuses to get its hands dirty with the materiality of musical sound can say what music is and how it means by bringing it into the realm of discourse. All of this would be bad enough, except the irony goes still deeper. Because as I've argued, music's capacity to change the world lies in the very muteness that discourse talks over, in the linguistic silence drowned out by all the talking, which sounds like a cue to stop talking. The proximity of death silences discourse. Isn't that one of the things we take away from listening to the Heile Gedankesam in the time of COVID? In allowing the usual noisy chatter of the string quartet to fall silent, this strange movement makes space for a presence of luminous intensity. My point is not about taking life lessons from a piece of music, though we could do worse, but about the dissonance between what this music does what it makes present, and the musicological noise that rushes in to silence it. I realise I might have lost you way back, maybe the moment I said Beethoven, which is in the title. But this talk hasn't really been about Beethoven. It's been about making space to listen to what is mute in music, and thereby about a way of being in the world that engaging with music affords. Even Immanuel Kant, hardly a disbeliever in the truth of discourse, recognized the aesthetic as a special kind of critical thought, critical because involving a special kind of freedom, shaped by the particularity of the sensory, rather than being closed down by the generality of the concept. Two centuries later, the triumph of sociological discourse over the aesthetic is a case of the empire strikes back, the victory of discursive linguistic determination over art's mute opposition. The high valuation of art, parted de Bourdieu, arose because the aesthetic is a space that resists the colonization through language of all experience and knowledge. To close down that critical space in the name of a discourse of emancipation, beggars belief. To challenge the new orthodoxies of a politicized musicology is hardly new. Martin Scherzinger pointed out back in 2004, the inadequacy of any simple opposition between exploring musical texts, now dismissed as backward and apolitical, and exploring musical contexts, now construed as a guarantor of the critical and the political. Instead, Scherzinger insisted on, quote, the importance of aesthetic values and formal characteristics specific to musical texts, unquote. So it's with a slightly weary sense of deja vu that I repeat his words now. He continued, quote, while this theme seems to take on an antagonistic quality in these times, I hope it will become clear that standing as the opposition to the opposition of orthodoxies does not mean standing as the enemy of that opposition. Unquote. He goes on 
quote, by broadening our historical sense of what aesthetics at its best meant, we might once again imaginatively grasp the radical particularity of musical experience, which in turn can resist the control of totalizing concepts and sedimented beliefs about it, unquote. In other words, what Scherzinger identified as new musicology's ideological closure, a programmatic constraint, is paradoxically at odds with the very thing it closes down, the emancipatory figuration of the aesthetic. Perhaps now is a good time to be asking ourselves how we might do things better, not by ceasing to discourse, but somehow opening up space within our discourses. More precisely, how we might allow the sonorous materiality of music to challenge our linguistic discourses rather than simply be silenced by them. The ways in which music makes sense, the manners in which it articulates its own kind of sensuous propositions are themselves kinds of thinking. To show these, to make them more audible, is to extend their critical potential. It's a way of refusing to allow the specificity of the aesthetic to be co-opted and silenced by the generality of the sociological. We resist this in relation to people, and we should do so in the case of artworks. If the silencing of the aesthetic in recent musicology silences the art in music, it also silences an idea of what it is to be human. It reduces both to merely a network of social relations, denuding the critical potential of that which lies outside any specifically political content, function, or practice. But I want to conclude not by making arguments, but by listening to music and giving space to what it does. Look musicians in the eyes. Those who know music from the inside and understand how it works. And tell them they're fools for putting so much trust in the music itself. Silly, ignorant musicians. If only they practiced their violins less and read more social theory. And composers, outdated narcissists, still taking such care in the placing of every note in the page. When the music isn't on the page, is it? It's all in the social context. The dots on the page are surely as arbitrary as the painter's brushstrokes on the canvas or the precise control of the dancer's body. Mere brute matter awaiting liberation through the discourse of some ologist who will finally redeem its silence and make it mean. Listening again to the Heilige Dankgesang is one way of making space for something different. The fragile slow motion dance of the four lines says nothing, makes no arguments, delivers no judgments. Cadential points that might articulate the logic of statement and counterstatement, proposition and conclusion are all blurred here. The music flows through and across them, negating closure with infinite openness. What does this music do? It continues, it carries on without goal, argument, logic or proof. The four lines hold together, they grow and recede, rise and fall, making a promise that lies entirely in their collective tone, an empathy embodied in their perfect ensemble, in the sensitivity of touch and timing, the unspoken understanding of their listening, 
a more musical musicology is not an apolitical withdrawal, quite the opposite. It's to make space for music, to allow what is mute in music to speak, and in doing so, to challenge all our discourses with the logic of the particular, with a way of knowing and being that counteracts the determining force of those discourses. The muteness of music is not a lack that needs redeeming by critical discourse. Music is not waiting patiently for the mansplaining of musicology. On the contrary, it inverts the usual signifying order by making sound appear instead of syntax say. It quietly undoes the imperative to interpret. And music, of course, carries on anyway. Humble musicians who have honed their mental, emotional, and bodily sensitivity to music over years of intelligent training and experience play on in knowing silence, undiminished by the tacit, but nevertheless arrogant judgment of musicology that they know not what they do. <laughs> 